wanted to, uh, decided to host this lecture. And so uh, the Islamic University College is a very key partner with us here on the ground in Accra. And uh, the representative there that I can see uh, is uh, Mujib. And he, as I said, if there's someone that he would like to introduce, he should introduce uh, after I'm done. But I am John Azuma. I am the executive director of the Sunday Institute here in Accra. And, and I welcome you. And it's my pleasure that we can host this lecture, co-host this lecture with the Islamic University College here in Accra. So uh, we have quite a number of uh, TSI uh, Sunday Institute staff here and, and and I, I welcome all of you. And all of you here are one way or the other friends of the Sana Institute and, and the Islamic University College, and we welcome you all. So I will like to turn over to Mujib, if you have a word or two, to say uh, sort of welcome also, or if there's someone else from the Islamic University College that you want to uh, pass the the responsibility to, to make to give a welcome also and then i will introduce our lecturer mujib if you can hear me thank you very much prof and um i am very um grateful for this uh, opportunity given and i would like to um, say a very big welcome to all participants to this afternoon's lecture Indeed, it's um, a lecture that we are all um, eager to listen to and to learn um, one or two from our renowned uh, lecturer, Professor Babu. And I'd like to use this opportunity to say uh, good afternoon to you, Prof. And we are very happy to see you. We wish we would have seen you physically um, and um, put our hands in yours. But uh, as Prof said, Allah didn't will it, or whoever didn't will it, when you come, <laughs> you will then tell us. <laughs> so um, we are having, our senior members are having a meeting, and after they are done, they will begin to join us. But I would like to acknowledge the um, presence with us on the platform here, one of our senior lecturers at the Department for the Study of Religions, University of Ghana, um, Dr. Godson Ahoto. He is here with us, and I am very, very happy that he's been able to join us. We also have with us um, the acting registrar of the Islamic University College, Mr. Kasim Mohammed Amin, who has also joined us. And in due course, many of our senior members will join. And when the need arises, we shall take the opportunity to introduce them as well. So thank you very much, Prof, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mujib, for all the hard work. Indeed, we'll keep, we'll keep uh, the fufu for Sheikh uh, when he comes down in March. So be prepared to eat some old fufu uh, frozen in the fridge. <laughs> so uh, our lecturer, Professor, Sheikh Anta Babu is uh, originally from Senegal, but uh, he is a historian uh, with expertise in Islam and the modern West African uh, Muslim diaspora. Uh, Dr. Babu has been a faculty member in the history department at the University of Pennsylvania since 2002. Uh, Babu is renowned for his uh, notable publications. And one of his publications that I have really, really appreciated and read a number of times over is Fighting the Greater Jihad, Ahmadou Bamba, and the founder of the Muridia of Senegal, uh, 1853 to 2013. Uh, this is a, a very important work that I will highly recommend to students of Islam in West Africa and students of Islam in Africa as a whole. He followed that up with another publication, The Muridia, on the move, uh, Islam, Migration and Placemaking. Uh, Prof. Babu has made significant contributions 
uh, to scholarly journals in the United States and France, and the International Journal of African Historical Studies, as well as the Journal of Religion in Africa, among others. Uh, Dr. Babu has also presented at international academic conferences as uh, is already given on topics related to Islam and the transnational migration of West African Muslims uh, across North America and Europe. Uh, at, the, at the University of Pennsylvania, Prof. Babu teaches undergraduate and graduate courses uh, covering Asian African history, colonialism, uh, decolonization, Islam, religion, and politics, uh, migration, and the new African diaspora. But most importantly, uh, Dr. Babu is a very good friend of, and a brother, uh, and a very good colleague, and a friend of the Sana Institute. Uh, we are co-editing co the, uh, the, the, the soon uh, to appear to be published the uh, first script of Lamin, the late Professor Lamin Sane. And so we've been working very closely uh, and we are looking forward to hosting him in person here in Accra with students uh, in March. So Dr. Babu, you are welcome to this uh, online platform. Uh, we have quite a number of people who are gathered here eager to listen to this lecture. And I turn the platform over to you and welcome you to, to, to start your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Azuma, for that generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Mujib, and our friend and colleague of the uh, Islamic College University. Um, as Dr. Azuma said earlier, my intention was to be with you today, this afternoon, uh, but because somebody didn't want it or did not will it, <laughs> well, uh, uh, then I was not able to, I'm not able to be with you today. But we are grateful, we are grateful because, uh, you know, the Lord work in ways that are sometimes uh, difficult to understand, but let's be grateful that we have now this technology that can allow us to have an alternative to my physical presence. Thank you so much. So um, my talk for today uh, is entitled, the technological things. So my talk for today is entitled, Reimagining Dar al Islam, Muslim minorities, and the question of belonging. Islam, as we know, requires of the believer both orthodoxy and orthopraxy. It's a way of life that resists confinement to specific spaces and aims to govern the entirety of the Muslim life in the private as well as public spheres. Islam is foreign to the idea of consecrated sacred space. Allah has made the whole of a mosque for Muslims to pray. Throughout history, most Muslims have been freely able to live and practice their religion in the public realm because they have lived in majority Muslim societies excuse me, or in societies ruled by Muslims. The idea of Dar al Islam refers to those spaces where Muslims enjoy political and cultural hegemony, while Dar al Harb depicts spaces deemed hostile to Islam and Muslims. The dispersal of Muslims beyond Dar al Islam and the formation of Muslim minority communities in non-Muslim contexts force Muslim thinkers to address the relationships between space, faith, and identity in Islam. Some have discouraged Muslims to settle in non-Muslim lands, while others have affirmed the duty of Muslim 
to migrate from land that have fallen into the hand of non-Muslims. More pragmatic scholars have tried to bridge the rigid boundaries between Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb to pave path of accommodation for Muslim minorities living in non-Muslim land. The idea of Dar al-Ahad, that is land of truth, or Dar al-Sulh, land of treaty, serve this purpose. While being outside of the domain of Islam, these spaces are deemed appropriate for Muslims to live in because they provide peace and protection for their faith. It is important to note that the concept of Dar al-Islam, Dar al-Harb, and Dar al-Sulh are not found in the Quran or the Sunnah. They emerge in the context of the expansion of the Islamic Caliphate over a century after the passing of Prophet Muhammad. They are therefore dated human construct of Muslim scholars trying to make sense of the world as they envision it. This effort by Muslim to devise path of accommodation of Muslim in non-Muslim land continue today, they have taken a sense of urgency in the era of globalization, the rise of Islamophobia, and the formation of Muslim minority communities in the West. Today, over 30% of the Muslim Ummah live in non-Muslim land. Due to the challenges that confront these Muslims with regard to religious life in non-Muslim settings, a considerable number of them seek fatwa, sometimes delivered by scholars unfamiliar with their living condition, so that they can live in accordance with the principle of Islam in non-Muslim settings. My purpose in this presentation is to explore the effort deployed by Muslim scholars in the West to formulate theories and practices aimed at providing tools to help Muslim minorities adapt to non-Muslim lands while remaining rooted in their faith. Muslim thinkers, particularly those living in Europe and in the United States, have taken up the challenge to develop new interpretations of Islam's sacred law in order to reconcile fiqh and Western secular law and to make it possible for Muslim minorities in the West and elsewhere to fulfill their aspirations of being anti-Muslim while enjoying the rights and obligation of full citizenship. These efforts are led by thinkers such as the late Tahajabir Tahaj Tahaj Al-Albani, the late Yusuf Qaradawi, and Tariq Ramadan. I conceive of the interpretation that these thinkers propose as epistemological practices that call for the rethinking of some aspect of the ibadat and the muhammalat, particularly concerning the areas of family law, the economy, and more recently, women's rights and human rights. In addition to epistemological alignment, other Muslims have thought reconciliation through experiential practices that relate to the use of space, the promotion of ecumenism, tolerance, and interfaith dialogue. These efforts have led to the development of a new branch of the Islamic jurisprudence that addresses the specific judicial needs of minority Muslims living in non-Muslim land. Two key legal principles undergird Muslim scholars' effort to adapt fiqh to changing social condition over time and space. Those principles are maqasid, al-sharia or masaqid al-din that refer to the ultimate objectives of God's revelations, and maslaha or the common good. The concept of maqasid first developed among others by Abd al-Malik al-Juwaini in the 11th century, Imam al-Ghazali in the 12th century, and Abdul Ishaq al-Shatibi in the 14th century, is rooted in the idea that maslaha was actually God's purpose in revealing the divine law. And its specific aim was the preservation of five essentials of human being. These essentials are religion, life, the intellect, lineage, and property. 
the objective of maqasidul sharia or maqasidul din is to discover and explain the wisdoms behind rulings such as for example enhancing social cohesion which is one of the wisdom behind charity being good to one's neighbors and greeting people with peace wisdom behind rulings also include developing consciousness of god which is one of the rational behind regular prayers fasting and supplications more broadly maqasid is the branch of islamic knowledge that beyond performative rituals strives to understand the intent behind islam's prescription for example why do muslim pray give zakat and fast and prescription for example why do islam prescribe drinking alcohol or punish rape and murder with the death penalty and how these prescription and proscriptions reflect on society and the relationship between the believer and god maqasid ul din is then rooted in the belief that the maqsid that is the purpose objective principle intent goal and or principle of islamic law is there for the interest of humanity over time muslim muslim legal scholars have developed differing view on maqasid and maslaha and the role they should play in the interpretation of islamic sacred scriptures some saw them as secondary principles that should be constrained by scriptural sources such as the quran and the sunnah others regarded them as foundational independent sources of law that could override specific references based on the letter of the scriptures in our time the latter view is championed in different form by prominent by prominent scholar especially those living in the west al alwani for example argues that the legal methodology of the new fiqh that is the uh, the maqasid or the fiqh of the minority as i explain later stresses the need for a new ijtihad that is not circumscribed by the inherited fiqh legacy in spite of the usefulness of the classical fiqh alwani argues it has some element that are inapplicable and or irrelevant to the contemporary modern life since the socio political context in which the classical fiqh developed was quite different from that of today's world because they conceive of maqasid as an articulation of the divine intent and moral concept upon which the islamic law is based such as justice human dignity free will magnanimity chastity facilitation and social cooperation contemporary legal scholars are able to expand the scope of maqasid from its focus on the interest of the individual that preoccupied early thinkers to address present societal concern such as women's rights justice and freedom human dignity and human rights and particularly the religious life of muslim minorities in the west the expansion of the scope of maqasid allow them then to respond to global issues and concern and to evolve from wisdoms behind the ruling to practical plan for reform and renewal they have coined the concept of fiqh al aqliyat or fiqh of the minority muslim to provide a framework for reconciling fiqh with the secular law that govern the life of muslim minorities living in western countries or elsewhere in non muslim land the concept of fiqh for the minority was first introduced by taharja bi alwani then chairman of the fiqh council of north america in 1998 al alwani underlined the necessity of a reformulated legal theory that can facilitate muslims integration into the modern and changing world but this is the fiqh 
that is directly induced from the scriptures rather than from the body of fiqh literature in the school of Islamic law. Theoreticians of fiqh for the minority urge Muslims to evaluate their normative statement over and against the masaqib, the maqasid. This will require the inflection of these norms across differing social settings to accommodate the different aspirations of Muslims, especially those living outside of Muslim majority countries. The ultimate goal is to help Muslims organize their everyday life in ways that satisfy their conception of piety while accommodating the core principle of Western civil and constitutional orders. In Al Qaradawi's word, this means, and I quote, preserving identity without isolation and integrating without dissolution, end quote. Here, I will focus more particularly, specifically, on the work of Tariq Ramadan, who is perhaps one of the most prominent theoreticians of the concept of fiqh for minority Muslim, although he questioned the use of the word minority, writing, for example, that in the very name of the universality of my principles, my conscience is summoned to respect diversity and the relative. And that is why even in the West, and especially in the West, we have not to think of our presence in terms of minority. And he added that Western society are conceived as other societies simply because people assume that what is normal society for Muslim is Muslim majority societies. But he argues this is no longer the case. The case. And what were once thought as some kind of Muslim diaspora are so no longer. There is no longer a place of origin from which Muslim are exiled or distanced and naturalized converted Muslim. Western Muslims are at home in the West and should not only say so, but also feel so. A Swiss-born French national, Ramadan is also the grandson of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. Ramadan's work focuses on two major issues. First, the reform of Islam based on the classical sources of the Quran and Sunnah, but whose principles are appropriately reinterpreted in the light of the modern world. And second, the legitimate role that Muslims should play within contemporary Western societies. Ramadan is not a legal scholar by training, so his work focuses mainly on the function of Islamic law in the formation of Western Muslim identity. He identified two main challenges that confront Muslim living as minorities in Western countries who are caught between what he called the twin dilemma of religious accountability and separatist and secularist acceptability. Some of these Muslims may be tempted by secularism in their yearning for acceptance in Western society, and the result will be loss of their religious value and Muslim identity. Others may yield to the pressure of a conservative Islam that rejects Western culture and promotes withdrawal from the public sphere. His research is an effort to enable European Muslim to participate as full members in Western society while simultaneously affirming their Muslim identity, since he sees no fundamental conflict between the value of Islam and those that shape Western civilization. Ramadan questions the validity and value of the classical concept of Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Haram. He puts forward the notion of Dar al-Shahada, or the abode of testimony, which he sees as more reflective of the reality of the context of Muslim life in the West. In his earlier work on Islamic education, Al-Alwani referred to what he called Alam al-Shahada, as the perceptible world, which is all that can be witnessed by a creative sense of mind or mind. Ramadan concept of Dar al-Shahada 
mirrors Alwani thinking in its focus and on its reliance on the maqasid to general new interpretation of the ibadat and muhammalat commensurate with life in the West. He elaborate on the concept of Dar al-Shahada in this point. One, reciting the Shahada provide the basis for a Muslim sense of identity as a Muslim, one who accept and believe God's revelation and is full member of the Ummah. Second, the Shahada also provide the basis on which other pillars of Islam can be performed with integrity. Third, the concept of Shahada implied that Muslims should not be prevented from affirming their Muslim identity and should be allowed to perform all the regulations required by their faith. Fourth, this concept also stipulates that Muslims are people who respect all of God's creation and all other human beings, including absolute faithfulness to agreements, contracts, and treaties that have been explicitly or silently entered into. Fifth, Muslims are called upon to bear witness to their faith, presenting and explaining what Islam is all about. This incorporates the concept of dawah or preaching calling. Six, living out shahada include both verbal witnesses and witnesses through good deeds. To bear the shahada means to be engaged in society in every area where a need makes itself felt. It also means being engaged in the process that might lead to positive reform, whether of institution or of legal nature. Referring to the prophetic saying that God has made the whole earth a mosque for Muslims, Ramadan suggests that whatever a Muslim saying, the shahada, is in security and is able to perform his or her fundamental religious duty, he and she is at home. Living in Dar al-Shahada also means being fully involved in one's non-Muslim community and contributing to it as a fellow citizens. Muslims should establish places of real encounter, dialogue, and commitment together in the name of values held in common by virtue of sharing a citizenship lived in an egalitarian fashion. For Ramadan, if Muslims are really with God, then their life must be a testimony to a permanent involvement and an infinite self-sacrifice of social justice, the welfare of mankind, the environment, and all forms of solidarity. While Ramadan's idea and practical suggestion have, come, have become central in our time, where the religious life of minority Muslims in the West face increasing scrutiny, they are not new. They irk a debate between so-called Muslim reformist and modernist Muslim in the wake of European imperial conquest of Muslim countries from the 19th century. They also reflect in, they are also reflected in the experience of Muslims in West Africa who live in spaces ruled by followers of indigenous religion or European colonizers. To finish, I would like to briefly refer to the Suwayan tradition and the teaching of Shah Madubamba of Senegal that to me constitute good example for experiential practices, although these were not theorized, developed by Muslim minorities in Sub-Saharan Africa to adapt to life in non-Muslim land. El Haji Salim Suwari, the founder of the Suwarian tradition, spent the earlier part of his lifetime in Masina in the current Republic of Mali in the 16th century, at a time that coincided with the collapse of the Muslim medieval empires of Mali and Songhai. None of El Haji Salim Suwari's writings seem to have survived, but information gleaned from local hagiological texts, local hagiological texts in Arabic and local languages can help sketch his biography and teaching. El Haji Salim is described as a highly learned and pious Muslim. He has performed the pilgrimage to Mecca numerous times. Source referred to him as Imam and Wali Allah, friend of God and leader of the Jahanke Jula community of West Africa. Elias Salim's teaching was instrumental in the construction of the identity of the diaspora of Juli, of Jula Muslim traders and scholars that span West Africa, including land governed by non-Muslim. 
Like most West Africans, he was a follower of the Maliki Matha, for most legal opinion. But in matters of Quranic exegesis, for example, he followed Al Suyuti, who was a Shafi. He found the latter's relative liberal attitude toward non Muslim more congenial. Al Haj Salim's teaching represents the foundation of a, pedagog of a pedagogical tradition that has resisted the test of time. They continue to shape behavior down to our time. This teaching concerns primarily the issue of conversion religion and the state, the relationship between Muslim and non-Muslims and jihad. These same questions are, as we've seen, at the center of the preoccupation of contemporary Muslim scholars living in the West. al Hash Salim taught that unbelief was the result of ignorance rather than wickedness. He argued that it's God, it's God's will, that some people will remain in the state of ignorance longer than others. True conversion, in his view, will occur only when God wills it. Therefore, forcing people to convert is tantamount to refusing to accept God's design for the world. al Haji Salim condemned the jihad of this word against unbelievers as unacceptable method of conversion. For him, recourse to arms is permissible only in self-defense when the very existence of the Muslim community is threatened by unbelievers. Regarding the relationship between religion and the state, al Haji Salim taught that Muslims may accept the authority of non-Muslim rulers and even support it so long as this enables them to live their life in according with their religion. For him, non-Muslim government is preferable to non-government or chaos. The cornerstone of Swahili tradition can be summarized in a few words. It teaches that conversion happens according to God's own timing that religion should be the province of clerics and not of rulers, and that the pen and tongue are more powerful than the sword in bringing people to the path of Islam. al Haji Salim inspired a pedagogy of conversion based on patient and exemplary behavior. This pedagogy required of Muslims, wherever they live, to embody the highest values and ideas so that they represent attractive example for people to emulate when, according to God's will, the time for conversion arrives. Finally, not unlike Ramadan, al Haj Salim emphasized the central role of education to ensure that Muslims keep the observance of the law free from error. al Haj Salim's teaching were preserved and disseminated through networks of scholars and teachers, most of them long distance traders, traders linked by isnads or chain of authority. These scholar traders carried the legacy of Suari Islamic tradition through half a millennium and have successfully aided the peaceful expansion of Islam, which they helped turn from minority to majority religion in the region of West Africa, where the religion was resisted for centuries. These scholar traders are not primarily interested in proselytizing but were in search of economic opportunities after the collapse of the medieval West African Muslim empires of Mali and Songhai. They were attracted, for example, by the availability of kola nut, an important item of trade throughout West Africa that grew in the conflict zone of the Sahana, in the contact zone of the Sahana, Sahaf, uh, Savannah and forest, and further east by the gold field of Lobi, Ano, and Ashanti. The spread of Islam was gradual and protracted. Muslim settlement first appeared alongside trade routes stretching from Jenne in current day Mali to Buna near the border of Ghana and Ivory Coast in land mostly dominated by non muslim These traders to whom the generic name Jola will be applied later founded Muslim enclaves where Islam functioned as an identity marker that bound people together and a source of mutual help solidarity and protection. They pave the peace, they pave the peaceful spread of Islam in land that resisted Islamization for centuries. It is possible to discern an epistemological kinship between the idea of fiqh of the minority, the Swahili tradition, and the thought and practice of Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba. Bamba was a Sufi, and Sufi theology offers perhaps 
the most compelling articulation of a theology of hospitality and tolerance to non-Muslim cultures. Perhaps one of the most salient features of Sufism is the distinction between the world of Batin, the Eden, the internal, and that of Zair, the manifest external. The Sufi's emphasis on Batin has important theological and organizational implication. Perhaps the most consequential of these implications is the suggestion that God can be known through other means rather than the divine revelation enshrined in the Quran alone. Because the world of Batin does not avail itself to discursive scrutiny, Sufi theology tends to favor universalist perception of religion that puts an emphasis on sameness rather than the difference that an exoteric and legalist reading of Islam would encourage. I am arguing that the world of Batin represents a universal spiritual canvas that provides space for the expression of diverse religious traditions. In their quest for closeness to God, one of the greatest rewards the Sufi long for is the acquisition of Marifa or Gnosis. Marifa is knowledge beyond the book that God gives to whom he wishes, but particularly to those that have succeeded in, befriend, in befriending him. Marifa is experiential knowledge that is acquired for ilham, inspiration, or kash, and veiling. Marifa is therefore immediate knowledge that escapes the scriptures of nature and the human intellect. It is in fact always received in a state of altered consciousness. For Sufis, the immediacy of this knowledge gives a ma'arifa certain superiority over other form of religious knowledge mediated by the sense of re or reason. Ilham and Kashf are the tools through which the Sufi unveil the hidden meaning of the Quran and in so doing avail religious theological, op religious theological, uh, religious theological openness. Marifa allows Sufi to reach beyond scriptures bound knowledge, denoting the view that the basic truth can be expressed in several religions. This pluralistic theological positioning explains why Sufi tend to stress the connection between Islam and other religions. This logic has brought some Sufis, such as Jalaluddin Rumi and the medieval Andalusian Sufi Ibn Sabin, to mitigate the claim of Islamic monopoly over the knowledge of God and to consider the, possib the possibility that divine truth can be found in other religions as well. Such theological innovations are only possible because of the unmooring of Islam from rigid legalistic structures and the Sufi's emphasis on God's immanence and the possibility of permanent, uh, personal and individual relationship with him. Sufi are able to make the theological synthesis and cultural compromises that explain their spiritual agility because they have always strived to keep their autonomy from the state. Ghazali's affirmation that the best ulama are those who do not know and are not known by the Sultan offer the best illustration of Sufi's suspicion of state power. Most Sufi favored escapism, choosing sometimes a peripatetic lifestyle, taking their message to remote places away from the center of power to the land where the influence of the state was weak. In doing so, they have enjoyed the freedom to model their religion in conformity with the idiosyncratic inspiration defying the conformism of ulama and their state sponsors. Amadou Bamba was one of those charismatic Sufi who founded his own community in Senegal in the late 19th century. Like Sufi who preceded him, Bamba drew inspiration from civil theology and philosophy to model his own community. Two key concepts, among others, provided the philosophical underpinning of pluralism in the Muridiyah tolerance and ecumenism. Tolerance is the conviction that the diversity of religions is due to history with all its affecting factors. It's a diverse condition of space and time, its prejudices, passions, and vested interest. Behind religious diversity stand Din al-Anaf, the primordial religion of God with which all men are born before acculturation make them adherent of this or that religion. Tolerance requires the Muslim to undertake the study of the history of religions with the view to discover within each the primal endowment of God, which he sees, then which he sent all his apostles 
at all places and times to teach. Sheikh Ahmad Mamba's ecumenism reflects the tolerance of Sufi and universalism. It is rooted in the Iman or faith and in the Sufi idea of unity of the creation, which implies that all human beings originated from one soul. And God has endowed humanity with reason so that men can distinguish between good and evil, and he has made it the duty everywhere to recommend what is good and to discourage what is forbidden. Because the human is in God's eyes, the single being to deserve to be entrusted with reason and intelligence, he is the Khalifa to Wildfield Ard, or representative of God on earth. So whether one is Muslim or otherwise, they belong all to the same family, the human family, and they are all Khalifa to Lightfield Ard. The ecumenism, the ecumenism and tolerance of Sheikh Ahmed Obama reflect, is reflected both in his interaction with people of other faiths, as well as in his relationship with fellow Muslims. It was logical that Bamba's absolute trust in God should also translate into openness of mind and religious tolerance. He repudiated the wholesale condemnation of people because of their beliefs and used forgiveness as therapy against violence. He wrote a poem to celebrate Mary, Jesus' mother, and praise some among his French tormentors who showed him empathy. Returning to Senegal after over seven years of exile in equatorial Africa, unjustly meted out to him by the French colonial rulers of Senegal, he proclaimed that he had forgiven all of his enemies for the sake of God. Let me just conclude with a few words here. Islam is a missionary religion, but without commissioned missionaries. There is nothing in Islam comparable, for example, to propaganda fide, propaganda fide, the Roman Catholic institution in charge of missionaries. Ulama and thinkers have historically shouldered the task of connecting Muslim communities across space and time and building bridges with people of other faith. They have done so by developing socially pragmatic form of reasoning that allowed a reinterpretation of the Islamic sacred scriptures to adapt to a changing world. I have tried to explain how in present time, in the context of a growing communities of Muslim minorities in the West, scholars are revising all are revising old concepts and theorizing new ones to pave path of accommodation for devout Muslim citizens of the West aspiring to live accordingly to their tenets, to the tenets of their faith, while remaining fully citizen of the West. This process of creative thinking is fraught with controversies. It is dismissed by both Islamophobists who promote the idea of a clash of civilization and the antinomy between Islam and Western culture, and by conservative Muslim who see any attempt to reconcile Islamic norm with Western values as surrender to secularism or a betrayal of Islam. It is refreshing, however, to note the growing body of scholarship produced by Muslims on both sides of the debate to make their case. We seem to be witnessing a new revival of the culture of debate and disagreement that has historically stimulated the production of religious knowledge, knowledge that powered the development of Islam in the past. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, my brother and Sheikh Babu. This is this is awesome. Uh, as you've all heard, uh, this is a, a very important uh, kind of exposition of the evolution of Islamic thought from its conceptualization within a majority context. Uh, to the present day where uh, Muslims find themselves in contexts that are very different from what, from the context that orthodoxy was uh, hewed out from. And that is, that is, is these kinds of exigencies that are imposed upon Muslim thinkers like Ramadan and our brother here to begin to think about what it means to be a Muslim minority uh, in a non-Muslim majority context. 
it's this kind of new ichtihad, if you like, that uh, is creating the tension that he's talking about. And uh, that uh, those who don't like Islam will say, well, Islam is not reformable. <laughs> Forget about it. Uh, and then you also have the conservative side who will say, no, uh, you can't do this. I wonder whether there is something for an African voice here, and he has brought that out from Sheikh Bambu, Sheikh Bamba, and Alai Salam Suwari. So we've got a lot of you here, and we will give some 20 minutes or so for you to raise questions. Uh, if you've got a question, just click the show by hand, and then I will call upon you, and then you can ask your question. If you prefer to use the chat, you can also use the chat, and then uh, we can get uh, our lecturer to respond to some of your questions. Thank you very much. I, I I have a question. Okay, I've see, I see a question here. I don't see a name, as I see a hand up there. If you can unmute and then introduce yourself and ask your question. I see PJ. I don't see a name, yes, a name on your screen. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's me, Jerry John Conway. Thank you. Yes, I have, I have um, a question for Sheikh um, about... Um, Muslim major, uh, minority in the West and non-Muslim countries or communities. Um, you see, um, over the years, we've seen some atrocities committed by Muslim extremist groups. Yes, um, like the al qaeda the Boko Harams and what have you. My, my question is what are the leaders of Islam doing about this so that um, they can actually redeem that image, that negative image about Muslims in um, the minority countries or the non-Muslim dominated countries. Because it appears that um, to me, if, I, if I'm supposed to, if I'm to weigh right now, they have a lot of freedom in non-Muslim countries as compared to Christians in Muslim dominated countries. For example, we know of persecutions that are ongoing against Christians in Iran, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, and even yeah, some other countries. So what, what are the leaders doing to strike a balance so that Muslim minorities can live in non-Muslim dominated communities? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is, this is really a very important question, I think, that is uh, quite timely. So I, I just wanted to start by saying that in reality, Muslims are the one who suffer the most uh, from the violence of extremists than non-Muslims. Uh, I just want to give the examples of uh, Afghanistan today. It's the Sunni, it's the Shia actually, that are the greatest victim of ISIS in Afghanistan today. Uh, if you take the case of Egypt, uh, the greatest enemy of the Islamists are not the people that are not Muslim, but are Muslim they see as sellout or traitors. Uh, even in the case of Boko Haram, those who suffer the most of Boko Haram violence certainly are, are Christian or non-Muslim, but also Muslims, because people can only kill their neighbors you know, they only harm people that they have, their, they can have their hand on. And those most of the time are Muslim that live uh, with them and defer with them. I mean, if, if you look at the number of people killed by ISIS, mostly these are Muslim in Iraq and Muslim in Syria. So that, that's something that I, I, I wanted to say. The second thing about minorities suffering in Muslim land, it's true. It's true that Muslims living in the West benefit 
from more right, benefit from tolerance and respect of their religion than Muslim living in Muslim land ruled by dictators or Muslim that held an ideology that conflict with their own ideology, clearly. And this is something that Muslim says everywhere. Here where I live in the United States, uh, Muslim always come out to criticize Muslim nations that actually are the very responsible of their migration or their exile. They are running away of Muslim land to be welcome in the United States where they find more tolerant for the religion. So then the problem is not really about the way I understand it, Islam itself, but it's about leaders. It's about interpretation. It's about politics. Uh, Islam is like any other religion. Um, you can make it a tolerant religion. You can make it also a violent religion. I mean, any of us who know something about the history of religions clearly, uh, whether it's Christianity or Orthodoxy and even Buddhism today, we can refer to the case of the Rohingya, for example, in Burma that are victim of genocide. So these are issues, I think, uh, that goes beyond the religion itself, its theology and its doctrine it's really a problem of human beings because you can just make uh, of sacred scriptures do whatever you want it to do. Uh, and, and, I, and what Muslims are doing about it more concretely uh, to respond to your questions is that unfortunately these Muslims are not heard because people are not expecting that kind of discourse to come out. But I don't know how many fatwa do you have that have come out to condemn Boko Haram to condemn ISIS and to condemn Al Qaeda. The fight that Muslims are making against extremism is a fight about knowledge. And unfortunately, it's a fight that many are excluded from. And those who are, who are aware of that fight don't seem to be interested in talking about it. Rarely would you see in the country I live in, in the United States, rarely would you see a Muslim scholar, a Muslim thinker be invited on TV in a major program to talk about what Muslims think about extremism. Because what is expected is Muslims are always extremists. So when you denounce criticize extremism, you are not considered as part of the mainstream. You are considered as an outlier that don't count. And the reality is the overwhelming majority of Muslims are against extremism and just to want to live in peace. And this is how Muslims have lived in the past. I mean, we don't have the time to get back to the time of the Prophet and the Caliphate. Uh, we don't have the time to talk about the Zimmi and the Aman. These are non-Muslim living in Muslim land uh, that have benefited from protection from Islam and the Islamic texts themselves. Thank you. Thank for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Babu. And, uh, I will go on to Emmanuel, and then uh, after that, uh, Abraham. Yeah, Prof, thank you. And Prof Babu, thank you very much um, for the presentation, a very interesting one. Um, I, I see what you are talking about, the attempts by Muslims in minority position to try to reinterpret the Islamic law and how to live. I see it in a more organized way in the West. Um, so in Europe, you have the European Council for Fatwa and Research who keep coming forth with fatwas and all those things. But it seems to me that this is so because many Muslims in the West are migrants from um, majority Muslim countries, and that's where they could organize themselves and pursue this. But I'm wondering if you think there is something else that can be learned from the African context where we have minority Muslims who were not majority in majority position before, but they have learned to live within their context, within their communities. I'm wondering if you have a comment on how minority Muslims in African context who have been minority in minority position from the beginning, how they've been able to deal with um, 
uh, how to live their faith and even practice their faith within their minority position if there is something that can be learned from um, that experience. Apart from those that you spoke about earlier of Alaji Salim and the others. Are you talking about contemporary, the contemporary situation you're talking about? He's, because he's already talked about Salim Suwari and also the Sheikh Bamba. He, Yes, yes, um, I acknowledge those ones, but I'm talking of um, contemporary situation and also as a community. So Alajel Salim and Bamba, these are individual clerics, but as a community, how they've been able to handle this kind of uh, minority experience. But you talked about the Jula. Anyway, he's talk the Jula is a major Muslim community in West Africa. But let, let me let uh, uh, Dr. Babu answer the question, please. Yes. Of course, uh, Muslim minorities uh, in uh, Africa and elsewhere have also a lot to learn from the experience of Muslim minorities in the West. These two communities are specially uh, separated but doctrinally tied together because we always should remember that Islam is orthopraxis. Muslim everywhere seek fatwa. Uh, and those fatwa derive not only from their local experience, but from the experience of the Ummah as a whole. So you have one dimension there. The second is, there is the legacy of history. For example, when you think of the case of uh, the Jula community, or you think of the Murid community, these are communities that continue to derive authority and legitimacy from a history and a tradition. In the case of Senegal that I know, better, um, Amadou Bamba and all the Sufi Sheikh in general have left a corpus of texts that today serve as reference for Muslim minorities, Muslim majorities in those countries actually to draw from, uh, to adapt their life to, to, a, modern, to, a, modern, to a modern world. Uh, clearly, this may not be the case, for example, of Muslims living in Zongos, you know, in non-Muslim, in, non in minority Muslim, Muslim society, but I think what is really important is um, the uh, awareness of the possibility of rethinking Islamic texts, rethinking fiqh in new way that can be informed not only by the past, but also by the present uh, among Muslims living within uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, placed community, but also from the global effort by Muslim everywhere. Uh, and all these fiqh concerns we are talking about clearly are not only concerned about adapting Islam to those local contexts, what they aim to do is a universal kind of redefining of this text that can inform the life of Muslim wherever they are. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. Abraham. Abraham, you need to unmute. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Babu. Sorry, I'm using a desk computer without a camera, so forgive me for not showing my, my myself. But I thank you for this very deep um, talk engagement with some realities that, as you said, are very timely. I just want to follow up on that question of tolerance. Uh, first of all, by saying that um, the tolerance that was referred to in the West is, is a little bit exaggerated. Um, it, it is, it's not uniformly uh, expressed or, or, or willingly um, meted to, towards Muslims. Um, so it's a little bit exaggerated. And also to say that there are many Muslim countries where Christians are allowed to worship freely. Uh, maybe Saudi Arabia is not the case, but there are many other Muslim countries where uh, Christians can, can exist and operate Really, including countries like Iraq and others. So we shouldn't paint with such broad strokes the realities of um, uh, freedom of worship in, in either situation. But um, what disturbs me in this conversation vis-a-vis -vis Christians and Muslims, and especially looking at it from a Christian point of view, our, our, our commandment or our instruction is clear to love the neighbor, even the enemy. So the language of tolerance 
sits uncomfortably in that in 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 that um, relationship that we are called to espouse, whether it's towards Muslims or even people we don't like, traditionalists and so on. So I don't know what what you can say about about that. If we throw love into the in, into the conversation, uh, is it something we can we can we can we can propose and 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 speak of instead of tolerance? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, you know, uh, the tolerance I was uh, outlining here is my understanding of Ahmadou Bamba's own understanding of tolerance. I'm not addressing what is happening in the West. Uh, I'm thinking of tolerance in the context of Sufi thinking, which uh, sometimes is seen as very exaggerated. Uh, in fact, Jalaluddin Rumi himself and Sufis like Ahmadou Bamba are dismissed, for example, by, by some uh, Salafist, all Salafist indeed, as you know, people are not true Muslim. That really are, to some extent, um, arguing that there is no hierarchy in religion. Every religion is the same. You know, that's that the critique that they get from uh, from from um, from those Salafists. So it's really an ideal type in the kind of Weberian understanding of it. It's what I wanted to describe is an ideal type of tolerance in the understanding of Sufis. And, and you're right. I think you're right by, by maybe I have misspoke, if, if you know, I haven't, I've been misunderstood. What I was trying to, to explain when I talk about the religion, the relationship between Christian and Muslims, um, clearly there are many cases, and as, these are the majority of cases where Muslims and Christians are very comfortable and, 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 and uh, 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 pro, uh, benefit from the same freedom than people elsewhere. I mean, the country I am from, Senegal, was led by 20 years by a president who was a Christian from 1960 to 1980. The following president was a Muslim, but his wife Christian. The second was a Muslim and he was Christian. Our first president, where we have a Muslim couple in the assembly, was elected in 1912. <laughs> in, in, I'm sorry, in 2012. So for over 40 years, Senegal was led by a president who is Christian or a president who is a uh, uh, first lady who is a Christian. In, in Senegal, Muslims celebrate Christmas, Christians celebrate Eid. People have the tradition of cooking for each other. It's a very common for Muslim men to marry Christian women because Islam allows that. Uh, Muslims are allowed according to Islamic law to marry a woman from the Ahlul Kitab, Jewish or Christian. So Senegal doesn't have that problem, actually. Uh, there are many more, many more Christian uh, 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 holidays than actually Muslim holidays in Senegal. And Senegal is not alone. I'm just giving it as an example, but it's, it's not alone. In West Africa, particularly, I can say the same thing for Guinea, the same thing for the Gambia, for Mali, and so forth. I'm just here uh, keeping close to home but you can generate in Iraq and you can generate everywhere. So what we're seeing today is very recent. It's very recent. Uh, in fact, after the independence of Israel uh, in around 1948, uh, Jewish was encouraged to leave Muslim land to go to Israel because Muslim, uh, uh, there were more Jews living in Muslim land than elsewhere because of the protection of the notion of Dhimmi, because those pogroms that happened in Europe did not happen in Muslim land. Mm. So it's just to say that there is room for peaceful cohabitation between Islam, Muslim and others in the Muslim Caliphate. This is the history of the past. This was also the present until, you know, what happened after the both of Israel and other things that happened until colonialism set in, and it really transformed the perception that Muslims have of, 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 of others that are not of their religion, uh, which actually don't have much to do with Islamic text itself and Islamic ethics and Islamic morals, but have much more to do with colonialism and imperialism and ways of finding way to fight uh, against colonialism and liberalism. I mean, now I think uh, scholar 
really agree of what we call today Salafism is very much a creation of modernity. Although people will go in the past to find justification of their ideology in the 20th century, but Salafism as we know it today is the creation of the 19th and 20th century, absolutely. So, uh, what else do, you, do I need to say? Love. Well, love is really something that uh, is, is, is important. Uh, uh, in Islam, there are many uh, texts that enjoin Muslim to want for others what they want for themselves. This is the prescription of in the Hadith. I think it's in the Quran, mm. uh, where Muslims are uh, enjoying to love, to respect their neighbors, mm. and to want for them what they want for themselves as Muslim. Golden. I think th th this is this is a uh, uh, an entry point really where we can address the issue of love as 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 you suggest. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is so helpful. And as you said, I think uh, Abraham made a very important point that sometimes we need to bear in mind that the situations are very complicated, and whether we are talking about the the the, the teachings or we're talking about how the teachings have been interpreted over the centuries, or we are talking about the practice, uh, it's all mixed. It's a, it's the, 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 it's always very patchy. Uh, whether we're talking about Islam or Christianity. And uh, if you talk about uh, even ISIS, uh, or whether you talk about Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, I, I think it's very simplistic to just think that they are going after Christians because if Osama bin Laden wanted Christians to kill, I don't think he would be have he would have to go to New York. He would have found many Christians around him to kill. Uh, so there are some political and ideological underpinnings to a lot of these things that we cannot just brush aside and simplify them as. Uh, uh, Muslims and Christians killing each other. Yeah. Uh, so th these are very complicated uh, issues. Just to add a few, uh, just yeah. uh, 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 John, to, 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 to really uh, further emphasize what you said. Well, those, those Christians that ISIS killed, these are the oldest Christian denomination in history. Yeah. And they are there yeah. and have been living in Muslim land for how many centuries? Yeah, yeah. Well, they are there because they have not been erased. Nobody yeah. said kill them. That's right. <laughs> you know, if it was Islam that wanted them dead, mm -hmm. ISIS would not find them there. Mm -hmm. You see what? I'm... So it's it's really as you said. We must be uh, mindful of uh, ideology of reinterpretation yeah. uh, and of a whole host of attitude that mm -hmm. are shaped by politics. Yes. And contemporary issues than doctrine and religion itself. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? We have about five minutes if anyone has a question. There, there is a question in the chat. So, uh, oh, Bam, yeah, there's a back. question here. Yeah, yeah Dara Islam, Dara Shahada, and uh, what about the concept of minority? to that of citizenship in majority Muslim countries, as uh, proposed by Imam al Taib. Uh, citizenship, I think you touched upon that, Sheikh, but uh, citizenship can apply in both majority and minority contexts. Uh, whereas uh, Dar al Shahada may be very much a limited kind of, uh, 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 kind of, uh, uh, concept for, for, for the majority for the minority context. Would you want to address that question of the citizenship, if the, even though you touched upon it? Yeah. Well, uh, Darul Shahada uh, is as articulated by um, Tariq Ramadan is, is really is a way of rethinking Darul Islam. Let, let's move beyond the idea of Darul Islam because Darul Islam has reverberation into constitutionalism, uh, into a state, into tax, uh, into a variety of things that may be limiting for a non-Muslim. But when you think of Dar al-Shahada as any space where the Shahada is allowed and the Shahada is just bear witness, then you're opening up 
really Dar al Islam as a land where diversity uh, is very much uh, something that is constitutionally accepted and where you can live your religion without worrying about constitutionalism, about text, about rule, and so forth. Where as a human being, you have the freedom to interpret things and not beholden to a fatwa or to whatever it is. I think that's his idea of Dar al-Shahada. Forget about Dar al-Islam with all the strictures that come with it and the baggage, the historical baggage that come with it. Because when you think of Dar al-Islam, you always think of Dar al-Hab. Think about that. Think of Dar al-Shahada as any place, as a Muslim, your Shahada is accepted. Um, that they are, you, you, you have the freedom to bear witness, to pray and to do whatever it is that you do. Then when you do that, there is no longing for Dar al-Islam anymore because Dar al-Shahada mm. clearly uh, can be a domain open uh, uh, anywhere. Mm. Now, for minorities in Muslim land, the old history, and this is also where Lili Makazit are important. When we think of history, the way that Islam dealt with foreigners, and I, I must say from the beginning, that Dar al-Islam was never meant for Muslim alone. Dar al-Islam, of course, made provision for Zimmi. Uh, these are Christian and Jews that live among Muslims and became part of the Muslim Caliphate. But Islam also made provision from the stranger, the Aman, somebody who is visiting either as a tourist or a merchant or a refugee or people that seek protection under Muslim land. Sharia law and fiqh has a provision for them. It's the aman and the mustamin. The aman is protection in Islam. It's provided uh, to people who come to seek protection within Islam. They have right and obligation. Uh, they have the rights to stay for a year, uh, not to pay tax, zakat, to have the freedom of their religion, to have freedom of their business, and, and to live respected in Muslim land. Beyond one year, if they want to stay in Muslim land, then they become zimmi, meaning they become protected and they will be subject to the same uh, rule as the zimmi that, as you know, are among Muslim land protected, but they have to pay the jizya, which is a tax because they don't pay zakat. My sense is these are some of the concepts that really are at the center of the thinking about maqasid. Clearly, in our contemporary world we live in, this idea of aman need to be rethought. Well, you have to rethink it because it's entangled now with the issue of a licensed nation state. Mm. When all of these concepts were actually coined, the idea of nation state did not exist at all. What existed was the old concept of multicultural, multi-ethnic empire. Now in the context of the nation state, clearly all these ideas have to be rethought because a, a Christian citizen uh, in the land of Islam uh, clearly cannot be considered a man. He has to, his, his situation has to be rethought and he should benefit from constitutional rights. And I think it's what is happening. Uh, I, I, I'm not a specialist of, uh, of, of Islamic law, I'm a historian, but uh, clearly if you go to Egypt where you have a substantial uh, minority of Copt, they do have the same rights as Muslim, the way I imagine it. Although it seems that they are not as happy and they used to be in the past, before what happened happened. In the past, they were happy there. By the time Egypt was independent, you had more than 10% of the population, until recently actually, 10% of the population of Egypt was formed by Copt Christian. With the rise of you know, Islamism and all those ideas, things have changed. Uh, but still there is a substantial minority of Copt in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Egypt, I assume that they have the same rights and the same obligation as Muslims. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Islam University College, uh, Mujib. And if you want to ask your question or make your comment, and then if there is one or two that you want to mention from your team, that would be great. Thank you, Mujib. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Um, and um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Sababu, for a very beautiful presentation. Um, I I want to make reference to um, um, the the concept that you have or the ideas you have espoused from the various scholars you have made reference to. I think that 
Um, it presents a very clear departure from the idea that existed from the fourth or the fifth centuries to the ninth century involving the closure of the door of Ijtihad, Isidat Babel Ijtihad. And so the ideas, these are ideas that scholars are espousing today, is a clear departure from what existed um, previously. However, it does pre present some kind of problem out of which we see what the extremists are, you know, the views that extremism presents, where, you know, they go to the Islamic sources and they want to proffer some forms of fatwa, which they believe is what the reality is. And I think that it's important that our scholars um, come out and outline the fact that um, it is not everybody that has the capacity to fatwa, but that one has to be trained to a certain level, attain to a certain level of knowledge before they qualify for, to be able to do fat, fatwa. And so we need to um, emphasize the point that it is not everybody at all that can go to the sources and then be able to come out with things that everybody, uh, that they, they can proffer as fatwa. I don't know what your views may be um, on, on this. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. I think um, when you look at the work of Alwani, uh, Aradawi and Tariq Ramadan, the call is we've got to go back to Ijtihad. Uh, the inherited legal body of work from the uh, from the Mahdab cannot do the work. They are produced in a context that is sociologically different, <laughs> politically different, economically, culturally different. They cannot continue to have the validity and authority they had in the past. Yet Muslims live in the present, and the present has its own demand that we need to meet. We cannot meet them with this legal corpus that is there, in which some, in some ways, have been sacralized and don't change. You know, to give you my example of, of West Africa, for example, we are Malikit. And we refer to the Muhtasar of Khalil for all fiqh. And the Muhtasar come from the Muwatta. The Muwatta come from Malik in the ninth century. How can you solve the problem of the 21st century based on text written in the ninth century? It's, it's problematic because there is limitation to Tawil, there is limitation to integration. So what these scholars are saying is, well, those who have the ability to do it, the knowledge to do it, should be empowered to get back to the classical text themselves, to the Quran and to the Sunnah. And what do they do when they go there? They look for the maqsid and the maslaha. What are the general aim and goal and ends of these hadiths? And then can we fulfill them with different practice? This is difficult to work. This is difficult legal scholarship. And as you said, it's not everybody that can do it. But I think, uh, the idea of forming all these fiqh council, we have one in Europe and we have one in the United States that was actually formed by Alwani. What they try to do exactly with that, um, and I've been following what is going on in France right now, and you also have imam that are definitely trying to do this. For example, issue of marriage, uh, prayer, uh, even little things like the ghusl, they are looking into these questions and try to move people from the kind of granular understanding of these things to really look at the big picture, if I call it that way. Look at the big picture. Look at what got intended. What was get, got intent in doing that? What was the prophet's intent in doing this? Uh, and that is more important. Maybe I can give just a, a small hadith here. Uh, to illustrate what I want to say. There is this hadith where the prophet sent a delegation to go to uh, meet a uh, an Arab tribe. 
And the prophet told them, uh, make sure to pray as of there. Well, this delegation, before reaching the place, the time of Asar had come. And the group was divided. Some said, well, Asar is the time right now. And this is Fiqh. Fiqh said, when the time of prayer come, leave everything and pray. The other say, no, no. The prophet said, pray Asar at that place. <laughs> divided. <laughs> so when they return to see the prophet, they argue before him. The prophet said, you're all right. Both of you are right. <laughs> Both of you are right. My intent was just to tell you to speed up. Go fast. Make sure that Asr truth find you there. That was my intent. <laughs> you know, my intent was not to say, change the time of Asr. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So the scholars are looking at these hadiths and make people aware of the intent of the prophet and the intent of God himself. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And you can have many examples like this in Islam where you, you really move away from the ritual performance, the ritual performance, and look at the intent. And then when you look at the intent, then you find wider room to adapt to local context. Then to seek to the granular, uh, which unfortunately is the problem is fundamentalism, you know. Fundamentalism, that's the problem. There is no room to think. There is no room for human's intellect, mm. human creativity. All is set in stone, nothing will change. Mm. So the idea of, of the of the Makassid is exactly that. Uh, let's get back to the primordial text of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah. Let's look, let's look at the Maqsid and let's look at Maslaha. Because anything that is against the common good cannot be Islamic. Mm -hmm. It cannot be Islamic because what mm -hmm. God intent first was Maslaha, mm -hmm. what is good for the community. If your interpretation of Sharia is completely destructive to the community, it cannot be God's will. Mm -hmm. It cannot be God's will. It, it, mm -hmm. It's your own mistake. But God doesn't will you to destroy humanity, to stick to a rule. Because God's ultimate goal is what is good for humanity. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is awesome. And uh, yeah, I like the whole idea of Nia of, of, of Nia and uh, intent. And I think this this is this is a very clear principle in Islamic teaching, even before you say your 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 your, your prayers, intent is very important. You must say it. And the intention is what undergets everything. And it's amazing how we forget some of these uh, things that we say every day and we take them for granted. And yet they are so pregnant with meaning and, and, and helpful meaning at that. Uh, one of the things that I want to leave us with is uh, Sheikh has given us a lot of uh, food for thought here. He's taken us through some of the scholars who have really spent time to engage with some of these challenges uh, during their time in African contests like Salem, Suwari and Sheikh Bamba. Uh, uh, and then Tariq Ramadan is in the Western context really grappling with these questions. And I, I, I want to pray that uh, we'll have more of younger and up and coming contemporary Muslim scholars like Sheikh and uh, others who, who can also take this challenge up within the African context. We, we can't keep talking about Bamba and uh, Salem alone, Suwari alone. We need we need to get new, uh, re, uh, uh, fresh thinkers who can even recast some of those uh, their thoughts also in the light of contemporary African realities. Uh, and so, I know that that has also had its own challenges. We have uh, a Naim in uh, from Sudan who is uh, another controversial uh, uh, scholar, but but he is grappling with some of these questions. So we, we need contemporary African scholars who can take up some of these uh, 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 issues and, and take them further down the line. And we're thankful that Sheikh, you are here and you've helped us to think of those, uh, along those lines. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. Sheikh is going to be in Ghana, inshallah, uh, in March next year. And, and we will not let him get away with an in-person lecture. Uh, we'll let him get another topic. Uh, maybe talk about this very topic. 
uh, in an in-person lecture because there are many who would have been in the room who don't have access to uh, Zoom to join us. So we want to thank you all for, join, for making time to join. And we pray for all of you. I want to thank Sheikh and thank my colleagues and partners from the Islamic University College for this privilege to host this lecture. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God yeah. bless you all you and have a good time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.